I've shared a few things with you already about my journey into medicine and a few things about me on a more personal level, but I thought I would try and answer some of the common questions that I'm given about what life is like working as a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. So you go to medical school and that will vary from country to country in terms of how many years that is. In the UK, if you go straight from school, that's five or six years. If you're like me and you take the long way round and you do one degree first and then do it as a graduate afterwards, I was at uni for about seven or eight years. Then once you qualify, like all doctors in the UK, you do your two foundation years. In those two years, you do a bit of everything. You do a bit of general medicine, surgery, emergency department stuff, pediatrics. You might do some psychiatry. You might work in general practice to try and give you as much of a broad base of medicine as you can possibly get because after all we are doctors first and psychiatrists second we are there to treat disorders of the mind but in the context of a an entire body in front of you then once you've done those two foundation years it's time to choose what you want to do with your life and in my case that's where I chose psychiatry and you end up doing three years of what's called core psychiatry training that's six six month posts in a bit of everything in psychiatry so general adult working with men and women you might do older adult work so working predominantly with conditions like dementia um, and the way that schizophrenia and bipolar and depression manifest in older people child and adolescent psychiatry forensics learning disabilities psychotherapy uh, liaison and neuropsychiatry there's loads of different types of specialties that you'll do and then importantly you'll do all the out of hours work so get used to the emergency presentations that come in in the middle of the night. Then you do your registrar training for three years in whatever subspecialty it is that you want to do. In my case, I'm a specialty registrar in forensic psychiatry. So I'm specifically choosing to work with people with mental illnesses that have offended in some way, usually in secure forensic psychiatry hospitals or in prison. Then after that, you become a consultant. That's kind of the equivalent of an attending in America uh, in whatever the specialty is that you've chosen. And some people even carve out an even niche way of practicing. It's very variable. And the thing that I love about the job is is there's quite a lot of flexibility. So we treat mental disorders from birth to death in all their different forms. The common conditions that we treat are psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, mood disorders like bipolar and depression, anxiety disorders, so generalized anxiety disorder, PTSD, OCD, phobias. We'll also have a role in treating neurodegenerative illnesses. So there's a lot of work to do with Parkinson's and dementia and even conditions like Huntington's disease, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorders and ADHD, and the way that mental illnesses can manifest in people with intellectual disabilities because it can manifest quite differently. Trained to be able to use medications, psychological interventions, as well as social treatments as well. Usually a combination of the three. That's our biopsychosocial model. And we can treat in a variety of settings. So that might be in the community, in inpatient units. So in hospital, that can include secure forensic hospitals as well. We might treat people in prison and we might treat people in general hospitals as well, where we know that physical illnesses can manifest with psychiatric symptoms and psychiatric disorders can manifest with physical symptoms and medications can cause havoc with both. It's good to have experience in other specialties. There's quite a few people in psychiatry that have often done something else and specialised in something else, then changed their mind and wanted to go and do something different and they come into psychiatry. So you have people that have already trained, for example, as GPs or they've got experience for several years to quite an advanced level in surgery or paediatrics or general medicine. So that's quite amazing. And I think that so it's important that we have a broad base that we can still understand when somebody is very physically unwell from either a general medical or surgical problem and the basic steps that need to go into trying to manage it and how to get them to the right specialty. People with severe mental illness, particularly disorders like schizophrenia, might have difficulties and differences in the way that they communicate and then we have other colleagues in medicine who obviously don't have the same level of understanding about these illnesses that we do so it's important that we're also there to advocate for our patients when we think they are physically unwell Psychiatry is no different to other parts of medicine in the sense that we have people that are suffering and that are frightened from whatever ailment that they might have and that we have a chance of making that better. And for some reason, there's this almost pervasive myth that psychiatric disorders are less treatable than physical health disorders, which is just utter nonsense. I think it underestimates how treatable psychiatric disorders are and I think it forgets about the number of physical health conditions that actually aren't very treatable and we just like we do with mental illnesses 
focus on trying to reduce symptoms and reduce progression without actually being able to make drastic improvements to the disorder underneath. So we get to reduce suffering and that's one of the best things about the job. Diagnostically, it's extremely challenging. We don't have blood tests that give us an answer as to what the diagnosis is. Most mental illnesses don't show up on a brain scan. So we have to rely on the real subtleties in body language, in what somebody says and how that can change over time. We really have to use our eyes and our ears to make these really challenging diagnoses where differing diagnoses have differing responses to treatment so it's really important that we get it right i love that challenge it's that same reason that a lot of people don't like psychiatry but that same reason that other people don't like it is the same reason i love it um politics um medicine is political anybody that says it isn't is lying or putting their head in the sand because of that that also causes politics between specialties as to where can we treat somebody for example what if we don't have a bed available in a psychiatric hospital for somebody that needs it where do they go to really get the help and the support that they need so when that happens that leads to a big feeling of helplessness um and I don't like that feeling. It makes me feel like I'm failing in my job because I can't relieve that person's suffering, but I'm doing everything I can that's within my control. Be compassionate. We are so focused on risk that we sometimes lose sight of that individual suffering. And the idea should be that we be compassionate and aim to reduce suffering first. And if we do that, the risk usually takes care of itself. So just be compassionate. Often the people that you're seeing feel bad enough about themselves without people adding to it with bringing stigma into the room. I'd say to consider psychiatry. Uh, I don't believe that we need to sell the specialty. I think the specialty sells itself for those that are interested. Um, but really, it is a very, very diverse and wonderful specialty. Even if you don't want to pursue psychiatry, I think one thing to take away from your placements as medical students is the concept of counter-transference. That feeling that you get in the room with somebody and how you respond to that feeling in the interaction. That feeling often tells you a good deal about what that other person might be feeling. So if you're left at the end of a consultation feeling worried, feeling upset, angry, ask yourself why. Do a little bit of an archaeological dig and ask yourself whether that feeling comes from within you or actually whether that's come from the patient that's been with you because that gives you a little window into the mind that otherwise you may not have it's a really useful technique for any interaction between two people that you can take forward to any specialty that you might choose I think schizophrenia is a fascinating condition to treat. I'm always really intrigued as to why people's manifestations of schizophrenia can be so different. Why does one person hear voices of somebody that's familiar to them versus another that hears voices that are completely unfamiliar to them? Why does one person feel that somebody is or something is putting thoughts into their mind versus another that thinks someone's taking thoughts out of their mind or controlling them in some way? These individual differences are really, really interesting. I also think the pharmacology, so the way that medications work to try and make it better from a scientific point of view are really interesting these medications are not perfect by any means but there's still a, a scientific interest really in how they work and why they might improve somebody's symptoms i think the biggest myth that people have and this is almost always held by non-psychiatrists that think they know our job but don't actually do our job is they think that all we do is tick through symptoms of the icd or the dsm say here's your diagnosis here's some medications bye bye yes the icd and the dsm it has a list of different manifestations and you need to have so many of them for a diagnosis. But that doesn't mean that we don't also ask, well, why has this happened and cater it to the individual? And that's exactly the same as what we do in physical health conditions as well. So for example, if somebody has got a clot in the lung, a pulmonary embolus, we are going to use objective tick boxy criteria to try and diagnose that pulmonary embolus. What's their oxygen saturations? How fast are they breathing? Have they got a certain type of chest pain? And then when we do imaging, is there a certain blot in one of the pulmonary arteries that is of a certain density and certain size to say that this is a clot? These are all tick boxy things that leads to the diagnosis of a pulmonary embolus. But we're still going to ask, well, why is somebody got a PE? What is it about this individual and their risk factors that have meant that this has happened and why has it happened now? And is it likely to happen again in the future? We do the same thing with mental illnesses. The whole kind of point of me doing YouTube was to try and counter some of the misinformation out there and to be a voice of, of, of evidence when it comes to mental illness. 
I think there's a lot of people on YouTube and social media that talk about things that are outside of their field of expertise. And I think for people that are trying to seek out information, it's difficult to know what is reputable and what's not and who to trust. Being a practicing doctor full time makes my videos better. Doing these videos and the research that gets into it actually makes my clinical practice better. My hope is that people find this channel a place that is compassionate, a place that is helpful, a place where they can get accurate information, where it's safe. And I promise you, if I don't know the answer to something, I will say and I will go away and try and find out and bring it back to you because that's what we do. That's what good science and good medicine is. As always, be curious, be compassionate, be kind. And I will see you for another video very, very soon.